in this smartphone show, there's a report on the hottest new products from the likes of Nokia, Motorola, Toshiba and HTC from 3GSM 2007. There's also a feature on what makes a smartphone smart, what makes them different from normal feature phones. And I talk about open Wi-Fi networks and getting online for free. Now you may want to pause the smartphone show at this point and grab a paper and pen to scribble down notes and URLs. I warn you, we've got a lot to cover in a couple of minutes. February means 3GSM, of course, often the biggest show of the year, and Barcelona has been rocked by a number of significant product launches. How could I not start with the Nokia E90, the latest in its long line of communicators, with the familiar clamshell keyboard, but this time with 800 pixel widescreen, lightning fast 3G data, 3 megapixel autofocus still in vi and VGA video camera, plus quick office 4 in its ROM and built-in GPS. Phew. It runs S63 edition like many devices I've reviewed recently, so you'll know what to expect from its applications, though they do seem to have been tweaked for the much wider screen. The most impressive thing about the E90 is perhaps the integration of its two displays. You start an application on one, and then finish what you're doing on the other. Announced at the same time were two other E-series smartphones from Nokia, also based on S63 edition. The E61i is essentially the E61 that I reviewed back in Smartphone Show 10, but with extra application keys, a 2 megapixel stills camera and a slightly thinner form factor, while the E65 is a new slider design reminiscent of the Nokia N80 that I reviewed in Smartphone Show 12, but with extra phone-centric keys. As with many Windows Mobile smartphones in the last 12 months, there's a lot of common functionality between devices running the same OS and interface although the E90 is one that stands out as something interesting, different and hugely powerful. Apparently it has 80 megabytes of free RAM after booting, unheard of for an S60 device. Also unheard of is the starting price for the E90, but let's gloss over that for now. Two other Nokia launches at 3GSM are deserving of a quick mention. The 6110 is a navigation focused device with built in GPS and like the E90 it can take full benefit from Nokia's recent release of free mapping and routing to the world for both S60 and Windows mobile smartphones. If you haven't seen it yet head over to smarttogo.com and get your own free copy. Finally, before you accuse me of being in Nokia's pay I'll just slip in the N77, their latest mobile TV handset. Whether DVBH will catch on is another matter. The promo video shows a guy almost being run over on the street because he's too engrossed in watching the football. In addition to a revamp to its Q device, I was interested to see Motorola's new Motorizer Z8, based on Symbian OS and running a non-stylus version of UIQ3. This is a true smartphone with an innovative curved sliding form factor. It's especially interesting because it was developed by the same team that produced the superb Sendo X a few years back and which got bought out by Motorola when Sendo went bankrupt. Look for a video review of the Motorizer in a month or two. It's been all changed in the Windows mobile world with the launch of version 6 and some new names to get used to. The smartphone edition is now Windows Mobile Standard and the uh, well, other edition is Windows Mobile Professional. Quite a few of the devices launched at 3GSM were showing off Windows Mobile 6, including the Toshiba Portage G900 with a super high-res WVGA screen, and the iMate Ultimate 5150, a VGA screen again with a minimalist sliding form factor. Most eye-catching of all from the Windows Mobile world was the final official unveiling of the HTC Vox, combining phone looks with slide-out QWERTY keyboard, Although, to be honest, the Nokia E90 isn't that much larger, has just as good a keyboard and packs mountains more functionality, admittedly at a price. Unbelievably, all the above was just from day one of 3GSM. Smartphone Show 25 will have extra video footage and more detail on specific smartphones. Now, I know I discussed this way back in Smartphone Show number 5, but that was almost a year ago. And with so many new viewers now tuning in, I think it's high time the subject was refreshed. What is a smartphone? In other words, why don't I simply call every device on the show a phone? Mainstream advertising would have you believe that every phone is smart these days. And in a way, they're often right, with basic MP3 playing capability, a digital camera, playback of small video clips, and of course, presentation of your contacts, and sometimes calendar as well which is fine for the man in the street wanting a phone that does some other cool bits and pieces. But a smartphone can run third-party applications with a, a proper extensible operating system, 
ideally one that multitasks so that you can quickly switch backwards and forwards between email, web, calendar, contacts, and any other applications you happen to be running. Not to mention handling all sorts of multimedia functions, satellite navigation, mobile TV, and so on. Try doing all that with your average Java-enabled feature phone. The smartphone's aim is to be the one device you carry with you, the one device you remember not to leave behind, and the one device you sync or back up. A smartphone should be totally self-sufficient, to the extent that if your main desktop dies a horrible death or if you're stuck out in the wild somewhere, you could carry on the communications part of your life, offline and online, with some semblance of normality. In practice, as you'll have gathered from the devices I mainly review, to be truly smart, a smartphone needs to run Symbian OS or Windows Mobile under the hood. I'm discounting Palm OS, which has been dying a death in recent years, and Linux Mobile, which is yet to be battle-proven. The market leader by a huge margin, of course, is Symbian OS, mainly thanks to the huge sales clocked up by Nokia's S60 smartphones. Around 75% of all smartphones sold are S60 which is a statistic I try to reflect in the screen time of the various models and news items in the smartphone show. So, what of the future? I've said it before and I'll say it again. At some point, all phones will be so smart that there's no point in calling them smartphones. They'll simply be, you guessed it, phones. Giving me a bit of a headache for what I'll be calling this video podcast should I still be doing it in three or four years' time. But no matter. It's giving you, the user, a huge amount of intelligence in your hand or in your pocket. The integration of GPS and e-commerce, just starting out now, will be complete by about 2010, at which point your phone will encompass communications, multimedia, navigation, reference and shopping. Oh, and it will be free as well. Just as many devices are free today on network contracts. Welcome to the future. Now it's all very well having Wi-Fi on your smartphone and rejoicing in the fact that you can now get your smartphone online at broadband speeds for free. The problem is that Wi-Fi isn't always free. You'll have no problems connecting at home or, or possibly in the office where your Wi-Fi passwords are known. But what about the rest of the world? The so-called Wi-Fi hotspots you've heard about usually mean commercial networks at major transport hubs and eateries. Nothing wrong with signing on the dotted line using your credit card, but it can be a pain when there are several Wi-Fi network chains involved, depending on your movements. Uh, the payment system really can get in the way. One alternative is to stick to open networks, those which Wi-Fi users around you have left open for public use, either deliberately because they're public spirited or accidentally because they simply haven't gotten around to thinking about putting a password on yet. Either way, in most towns and cities you'll find hundreds if not thousands of open Wi-Fi networks and it's usually a matter of driving or strolling up and down a couple of streets until you come to a likely candidate. The legalities of piggybacking on someone else's internet connection, like internet sharing, are still being debated, but it's basically a matter of common sense, of not making a nuisance of yourself, uh, and not abusing the privilege. Here I've parked outside a house with a nice strong Wi-Fi signal, and I found that out by going into uh, my Nokia E70's connection manager, and it lists the Wi-Fi networks available, and down at the bottom here we have Kate uh, marked as infrastructure, and significantly there's no padlock icon to the side of it, so it's not a locked network. With most phone Wi-Fi aerials being quite small, I'd really only bother with uh, signals of 50 to 60 percent or more. Now, not all open networks are truly open. There are sometimes extra security measures in place or incompatibilities, but if you see the word uh, open here, open network, then you're halfway there. Boot up your web browser, pick a bookmarked favourite, and in the case of an S60 smartphone, choose Easy WLAN as the internet access point, picking the open network from the list of Wi-Fi signals shown. With any luck, after a short delay of a few seconds while the relevant network addresses are picked up, you should be fully up and surfing. If it doesn't work straight away, use Disconnect and then try again, and if it still doesn't work, then try another open network. Most of the time when you're out and about, you'll want something specific, such as a quick news fix or checking your email and GPRS is quite sufficient for these, even over slow, expensive and clunky networks. But for whiling away a spare half hour or for downloading podcasts or surfing large websites, it can save a lot of time and money using any convenient open Wi-Fi networks.